through the microphone, even though you're right in front of me. Because <laughs> I feel like God when I speak over this mic. <laughs> so we have a, we have a great a great uh, clinic coming up, um, featuring um, uh, amazing guitarist, <laughs> singer songwriter, um, formerly with. Greg Allman, please wel uh, welcome Scott Sherrard. He's going to be accompanied by Mark Poniatowski on bass and Casey Sherrell on drums. Well, clearly it's a beautiful day outside, and uh, everyone's having a great summer. So thank you guys for, and thank you for coming, and you, sir. And, uh, well, let's jam a little bit. We're going to play a Bruce Katz song. Bruce used to teach here. He's actually uh, the guy who inspired me to first start coming up here to hang out and give clinics and start teaching. So we're going to do this for Bruce Katz. This is a tune of his called Hipology.
Little blues to cleanse the palate. Thank you, guys. So, uh, well, I guess we'll, uh, we'll just kind of roll through a little bit of uh, some of the songs I've written and, put, and jam on them a little bit for you. And then, you know, I'll take some questions from you guys. We're going to get my friend Danny to come up and jam with us, who studies here. And uh, let's try, uh, let's switch gears a little bit here. Um, we're going to do a song of mine that, this song I was actually nominated for a Grammy for in, uh, what was it, 2017? The years are just blurring together. Um, this is a song I wrote with Greg Allman off of our, uh, our last album, Southern Blood. And um, it took me took me about two or three years to finish writing this song with Greg. It was uh, there's a there's actually an article I wrote about writing this song in a publication called Bitter Southerner. And uh, if you're up for uh, hearing the whole story, I'd encourage you to check it out. It'd take me like 15 minutes to tell the story right now, but <laughs> I was real proud we got this song done and um, do my best singing it for you today. Of course, Greg sings it very beautifully on the record. So this one's called My Only True Friend.
on and on I roam And it feels like home It's just around the bend And I've got so much left to give But I'm running out of time, my friend And I hope you're haunted by the music of my soul When I'm gone And please don't fly away Find you in Just can't face living this life alone. I can't bear the pain. This might be the end. And you and I both know. Oh, is my only true friend. Oh, you and I both know. My only true to continue with uh, the one that got away for the Southern Blood album. So Greg and I had finished writing two songs together. And, uh, you know, I spent, I spent about a decade playing with him. So I started out as the guitar player. And then uh, we just became friends pretty quick and uh, living on the same bus and uh, then after a couple of years, he started poking around asking me about leading his band for him and helping him get musicians and being the music director. So then I kind of graduated to that role. And then from there, he started asking me one day, he, he, he heard me sing at one of the sound checks and he said, man, I got to have your records. He's like, give me all your records. So he hands me his iPhone. And uh, so he goes, please just, I can't figure out how to sync these songs with my laptop, right? This is before the cloud and everything. So he goes, just please take my phone and my laptop, just put your albums on it. So 
I don't know what happened. I don't remember exactly, but I ended up erasing all his music, and only my albums ended up on his phone. So at that time, it was like four of my albums, right? And he told me that, like, oh, so I didn't find that out till I kind of gave up the end of the story there, but I didn't find that out till a week later. So a week later, he calls me to his dressing room before a gig, and he goes, he goes, Scotty, he goes, I've been listening to you all week. <laughs> <laughs> he goes, it's the only damn music on my phone. So um, anyway, so he, lucky for me, he really liked my records, and he said, man, I love your songwriting, and da, 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 and I want to start writing with you. So the first thing we did is I went down to his house for about a week in Savannah and, uh, you know, we just kind of like, Greg was real good at hanging out and listening to music and just kind of vibing. It was all about getting a vibe, so you had to spend a lot of time with him. But we kind of, this, this next tune we're going to play, there was something he used to say when we were on the road all the time. If we pulled into a uh, particular hotel or a town that he liked, he would always say, oh, this town has everything a good man needs. I said, that's a good song title. And then we ended up writing this tune. It's kind of a funky blues. We were also both really obsessed with uh, Johnny Guitar Watson. And if uh, you don't know Johnny Guitar Watson, you got to get in there because he he's really a musical genius. He's well beyond just a blues art, you know, blues artist or blues guitar player. Actually, his music, he was the guy, Johnny Guitar Watson, there was a track called Space Guitar. And I'd say that track... That was at least 10 years before Jimi Hendrix made a record, and it's basically everything Jimi Hendrix did, but on one song in three minutes. So that's kind of where Johnny started. And then as he progressed into the 70s, he did these absolutely incredible records that are just, I guess they're kind of funky, soulful records, but they just have these great songs, and uh, he just has the most amazing presence. And uh, if you don't know this also, he was like one of Frank Zappa's favorite artists. So if you're into Frank Zappa, um, you, you've got to know Johnny Guitar Watson because a lot of the personality that he gets in his his vocal and actually Johnny even plays on one of his records. I can't remember. And anyway, so Johnny was a big influence of Greg and I. So this was kind of our this this song was kind of our homage to Johnny Guitar Watson. I don't think I've ever told that story before. So here we go. Everything a good man needs. I don't need no confirmation I know where I belong I don't need no reservation I've been knowing you much too long And your love, it's like no other Sure to satisfy me Yes it did But babe, you keep me running You're everything a good man needs I need you to soothe me in the morning And rock me through the night I need you to soothe me in the morning, baby. Oh, and rock me through the night. You know the way she puts it on me. It sets my mood just right. Come on, baby. One more bite It's a whole lot better If you open your eyes you got to give me, give me, give me, give me One more try I know my kind of love Is sure to satisfy, baby
Yo, I fly you in from Dallas. Come meet me in Tennessee. You know I fly you in from Dallas, baby. Come meet me in Tennessee. And your love, it keeps me running. Oh, you're everything good man and Baby, I ain't funny, no, no You're a young child Driving me wild Baby, I ain't funny, no, no You're everything Shove my teeth. Oh, no, 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 everything. Thank you. So, um, so the part I left out about that song is that it was slated to be recorded on Southern Blood, and uh, Greg's health was in and out, so we never got a chance to do it. And uh, I just sat on the song. I figured I may never do anything with it. And then I found out that one day Taj Mahal called me, and he uh, had heard the demo that Greg and I had made of it. And he said, man, I want to cut this song. And I said, well, it's yours, man. Go cut it. And then he said, uh, well, I just put a record out with Kev Moe. And I said, well, what do you want to do? And he's like, well, I heard you're making a record. And I said, yeah. And he said, do you want me to sing it on it? So <laughs> that last song we played, Taj sang, sang the vocal, which, of course, is so meaningful in so many ways, because without Taj Mahal, there would have been no Allman Brothers band, as we know it, anyway, um, you know. Taj Mahal's record with Jesse Ed Davis playing slide, Statesboro Blues, that was what made Dwayne Allman pick up a slide. So for me, it was real meaningful, as Greg had, had already passed at this time when Taj wanted to do this, of course, it was very meaningful to have Taj actually sing the song, even though I sing all the songs on my record. Um, it was very meaningful to have Taj do that. I felt like it kind of tied it up. And the last piece of the story about the recording of this song, which all this stuff came out on my record that came out last year, in 2018 called Saving Grace. Although I don't know what the record coming out means anymore. I guess it was on, it went online in 2018. 
and you can now listen to it everywhere for free in 2018. But that, <laughs> this recording of this song with Taj singing it is on that record. And uh, Bernard Purdy is playing drums on the track too, who I was telling these guys earlier, I, I had met him on a tour in, in Europe a couple years earlier and we stayed in touch. And this, this whole track came together, I should mention, and I'm gonna segue into more about my Saving Grace record that came out last year, but this whole track came together when my entire soul album was mixed. That's when Taj called me. And uh, it was the time where I was nominated for a Grammy and the Grammys happened to be in New York City. So we were trying to find a date for Taj to cut this last song we played and we couldn't find a date and months went by. And then the Grammys were here and Taj was nominated. So he called me up the week before and he's like, look, bro, I'm gonna be in New York, book a studio. So I booked a studio, I got my band. And then um, I actually didn't have a drummer for the date. And out of nowhere, Bernard's wife who manages him, Celia, called me up and said, we're coming in town for the Grammys. Do you wanna have lunch at Sylvia's? Cause I live in Harlem and it's right up the street from me. And I said, I said, sure, let's, let's have lunch. And I said, by the way, um, do you, uh, do you want to see if uh, Bernard wants to play on a track with Taj Mahal? And, and <laughs> Bernard, she was on speakerphone, and they were in the car. And Bernard just goes, I'm on it. <laughs> so that was it. So, so, um, so then we all went to Sylvia's for lunch, which conveniently was around the corner from the studio I had booked. And um, it was just an amazing day, man. And we, we just, those two had, Taj and Bernard hadn't seen each other in a long time. And um, we got the thing in like two takes, of course. And I sat like right here next to Taj singing it. And uh, it was, it was an ama amazing day at the office, man. What can I say? Um, I, I'm a lucky guy. I've gotten to meet a lot of my heroes um, and work with them. So that was the last song we played, Everything a Good Man Needs, available now on YouTube. Yeah, Spotify, YouTube, iTunes. The royalties are just pouring in, guys. They're just pouring in. It's really inconvenient power. You know, you're out here and you gotta power up your Tesla somewhere and you just can't find somewhere to plug it in. It's rough. So the next song we're gonna do, we're gonna switch gears a little bit and um, more about my Saving Grace record. It's a lot to unpack because it was kind of a bucket list album for me. I was wrapping up, you know, at that time about nine years touring with Greg Allman and being in his band because it was really being in a band with him. It was not a, it started as a sideband gig and it really, as we added the right people, it became a real band and he treated us like a real band. He paid us like a real band. It was, it's really important to know that like that that project, I think one day everybody's going to find out more about what that project really meant to Greg and, and how profound that band had an influence on him as he did on us. So it was, it was a really inspiring thing to be part of, even though I was still doing some of my own gigs. But once I knew that Greg wasn't going to perform again, that's when I started making my Saving Grace record. And I, I through my course of working with him, I had come into contact with all of these heroes of mine, and not just Taj and Bernard on that one track, but I spent four or five tracks I cut in Memphis at uh, Electrophonic, and I used the high rhythm section on those tracks. So those are the Charles, Leroy Hodges, and Howard Grimes. So those are the guys on all those Al Green records, Sil Johnson, Otis Clay, um, Ann Peebles, I Can't Stand the Rain, Love and Happiness, Let's Stay Together, that's the band and they're still playing their asses off. In fact, I went to Japan with those guys for two weeks last year and lived with them over there. And, and, uh, and I just saw them a week ago. I just played in Italy with a couple of them on a festival. So um, that's about half my record. We're gonna play us, the next song we're gonna play is from the high records, I guess, rhythm section side of my, my album. And I think you'll hear when we play this song, um, it was really, inspired by those Willie Mitchell productions at high rhythm in the 70s. I mean, I grew up on those records, so. This one is a tune I wrote, actually I wrote this one quite a few years ago, but I was, I was waiting for the right opportunity and when I was getting in the studio with these guys, I wasn't even supposed to cut this. And I, <laughs> I remember I turned to my co-producer, Scott Bomer, and I was like, wait, there's a song we have to do while we're here with these guys, because this is why I wrote this song. So it was one of those moments, so. We're gonna give it a shot now. It's hard to do this one without the organ and the horns, but we'll, we'll do our best.
right, here we go. Words can't say. I'll take the top. like that. Thank you guys. So uh, 
The other half of the record I did in uh, in Muscle Shoals at Fame Studios. So, and I was lucky enough on that part of the record I had a uh, couple of the legendary Swampers rhythm sections. So I had David Hood and Spooner Oldham on bass and keys. And the drummer on that was Chad Gamble, who plays with uh, Jason Isbell. He's probably most famous for doing that. Um, Chad's an old buddy of mine. Um, so really, you know, making the Saving Grace record at that point in my career where, you know, I, I had also, you know, lost Levon Helm, um, you know, a few, quite a few years before that. And then watching Greg go and then getting to know all these great musicians in their 70s, I was starting to get freaked out. I figure if I don't make a record with these guys now, I'm never going to. So that was kind of the point of doing this record. So, um, And also, we did the Greg Allman Southern Blood record we also did in Muscle Shoals at Fame Studios. So Sa Saving Grace was the second uh, record I got to make there in that year, as a matter of fact. Um, so now we're going to play a song of mine that I wrote over a decade ago, but Greg Allman recorded this song with me on his records twice. He t we did it on Back to Making Live, and then we did it again on Southern Blood. He really liked this song of mine. Um, and uh, it became kind of a concert staple of the Greg Allman Band, actually, so I guess this would have been, uh, this probably would have been my hit song if I had recorded this in the 80s. This, <laughs> this one is called Love Like Kerosene. <laughs> my money started smoking cigarettes and I've been sleeping in the bottle she's not finished with me yet girls I'm bad bad whiskey devil in a fever dream I'm not going near the fire Meet me in the alleyway Round a card up to twelve Gonna bring some pills and liquor We'll go out and face some hell Girls like bad, bad whiskey Devil in fever dream Yes, she is Now I'm not going near the fire
started smoking cigarettes And I've been sleeping in the bottle She's not finished with me yet No two games Girls, I'm bad, bad whiskey Devil in a fever dream And I'm not going to the fire Who loves I can see I'm not going to the fire Who loves I can see Fire, love now. The kerosene, baby, yeah. Yeah, that's how that one goes. We got to get this guy out of here to teach a class. Casey Shirell on the drums, everybody. These guys are doing an amazing job, huh? I mean, we have been rehearsing all morning, so I think we <laughs> hours and hours of preparation for this. How about it for Mark Poniatowski on the bass, everybody? Did I get that right, Poniatowski? I told him, I said, if you get anybody to play with me, make sure their name is as bad as Sherrard. <laughs> they did a great job. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't believe what I get. The most common one is Shepard, which I think is really interesting. It just sort of turns all the R's into P's. <laughs> okay, let's, let's, do, uh, let's do a quick, you got time for one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's going to be late for his class, but they'll live. Yeah, a little extra time with the metronome before class. Everybody, um, I've been I've been privileged to teach uh, a few guitar players off the top of my head who've come through Berkeley. I've recommended a lot of people for Berkeley who are going to be coming next year, actually. And uh, I do teach on Skype as often as I can. Uh, and also I have a studio, and I live in New York City, so I have a studio there I teach out of as well. But uh, I'm gonna bring a student on right now, my friend here, Danny Chiracco, who I've known for a few years, at least, right? You were a teenager when we, we used to study on Skype. He's gonna be a junior here at Berkeley, and what did I tell you, Danny? I said, if you're gonna study, you gotta go to Berkeley. He's from Florida, came all the way up from Florida to study here, and look at this. Now we're jamming at Berkeley together. Isn't that beautiful? So we're gonna we're gonna play. Uh, I figured let's find something we both know well. So we're gonna do an old. Um, this is an old uh, Sonny Boy Williamson tune that uh, that the Allman Brothers really made famous. Uh, and then we're gonna get Casey out to his class. And then I'll take some questions from any of you guys if you want to do that thing. One way out, baby Lord, I just can't go out the door The rainbow One way out, darling Lord, I just can't go out the door Cause there's a man down there No, oh, might be a man I don't know Well, you got me trapped, woman On the second floor if I don't get up this time, I won't be back no more, no. There ain't no way in the world I'm going out that front door. Cause there's a man down there, no, might be a man I don't know.
on the first place You know I want that song man Come take my place no There ain't no way in the world I'm going out that front door Cause there's a man down there Oh, might be a man I don't know Cause there's a man down there Oh, might be a man I don't know Cause there's a man down there Oh, might just happen to be your own man Oh, you just might be your man Oh, darling, I really just don't know, no, no. How about it for Danny Chiracco, everybody? Your classmate. We're student. One more time for Casey Shuler on the drums. He's going to go. He's got to go. So, uh, yeah, let's, uh, does anybody, uh, I don't know, last time I came here, I felt like I just talked for like an hour and a half. So I figured this time I should come and play more than talk. But does anyone have any questions about Anything? I mean, we can go in any direction. Yes. Nice shirt, by the way. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the most basic, the most basic thing with playing slide and standard, and I mean, honestly, I think I ended up doing it because I was like 20 when I moved to New York City and I lived in a five floor walk up and I moved there from Milwaukee and I had, you know, like five or six guitars and I had one that was tuned to open G and uh, I had a super reverb and uh, I didn't have that stuff for very long. You know, New York musicians, like, like drummers, like they just show up with sticks everywhere they go. It really freaks out people from LA and Nashville, you know. So I, I just started doing everything on one guitar. And, you know, so, so then I just started teaching myself slide and standard. So basically, to answer your question about, like, workarounds, if you take, like, so let's just take the key of D. Hopefully I'm still in tune, sort of. Um, if you take the key of D at the fifth, you know, fifth fret D bar chord, and you just take that triad right there. And then you just work around it. You know, you got the, the minor third, the major third, the fourth, the flat five, and the five. You can just go. You know, and then you got the root here. Two roots. Just play around with that for like about seven years. You know? That's about it. And it like, and by seven years, I mean the amount of muting and vibrato. I mean, I still feel like I'm terrible at this. But I've had to play with Derek Trucks like a bunch of times, so I never put the slide on when I'm anywhere near him. There's no one who's ever done it as good as he does it. Um, it's just a really specific thing that he's mastered. Um, so I hold myself to a pretty high standard. I have to. Um, but uh, And then slides. I, I Use the lightest slide you can find. This, this one I have with me today was actually one of Dickie Betts's. He had a box of 200 of these and my friend in Nashville got the box and uh, he gave it to he was going to give it to the big house museum and then uh, he hit me up and he was like look Richard at the museum said you can have a few of these before I give it to him so he snuck these for me this is a real 60s Corsian bottle and this is what exactly what Dwayne used to use they're here check it out So Dwayne used to play Dwayne's Les Paul. Now, this is what's been told to me by, by Greg Allman and by Richard, who does all the equipment for the big house. Dwayne's Les Paul was strung with 9 to 42s. He used to buy a black diamond set of 11s, throw out the low E, move them all up one, and put a banjo tenor E on the, on the, on the top string, which was a 9. 
So everybody who writes these articles where it's like, I put 15s on my guitar with a wound G to play slide. It's like, that's a thing. If you want to sound like Ry Cooter, that's good. Yeah. But if you want to sound like Dwayne Allman, like he was playing a 50 or 100 watt amp. So light strings, light slide, loud amp. That's, that's, the, trick, right? that's the mantra, light strings, light slide, loud amp. There's that story too. I don't know if you know that story. Uh, I forget who told me this. I think it was a guy who, yeah, I think this was, there was a tech who used to, he used to tech for Santana and Clapton. He had this, there was a story about, you know, Clapton always played nine to 42s. I think he's playing tens now. I don't know why, maybe, maybe he can't feel his hands anymore or something. Um, but uh, he sounds better than ever. Um, but one time, Clapton asked B.B. King if he should play with heavier strings. And B.B. was like, that's what the volume on your amp is for, man. <laughs> like, why do you want to work hard? You know? But everybody has a diff. It's all about your comfort. Uh, to me, it's all about the guitar being easy to play. But when you're thinking about playing slide and standard, the reason I bring all that stuff up is, like, you got to get somebody really good to set your guitar up. Like, I have an amazing guy in New York who's ridiculously expensive for a reason, and uh, he gets my action just perfect. And it'll last, like, this is my main guitar. It'll last six or seven months before I have to have it tweaked again. Yeah, so make sure you get a really good setup where it's, like, hybrid action. Yeah, not too high, not too low. Oh yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for thanks for loaning them to me. This guy's got a groove, man. Yeah, yeah. Back at you, man. I'll say hi to Quinones. I'll see him in a couple weeks. Yeah, yeah. Great pocket, man. Yeah, you guys are lucky to have musicians like this here teaching, man. These these guys can these guys can really play. Um, so, any more specific questions? We got the slide, st slide and standard is covered. Hey there, Danny. So, when you're doing kind of like those uh, main tunes that are like the same, oh, yeah. like two or three notes at once, yeah. what, are some, what are some things like in, in terms of like totally avoiding them? Like, how do you know which note is what you should be doing kind of thing? Like, are you, like the sort of the pedal tone type stuff? Yeah, kind of like the blur, blur two and then the big end stuff. So like the, uh, all right. So now this is this is gonna this is gonna seem like this is gonna be funny, but it's the same explanation as the slide. Yeah. It is. Well, the seven years is a good place to start with anything, but so there it is again, right? The root, the octave, minor third, major third, fourth, flatted fifth, fifth. place I got to with it is you'll hear guys like you're thinking of more like the George Benson type thing because yeah. Grant 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 Green so if you guys don't know who Grant Green is like he's one of my favorite he's like top five for me I actually learned about Grant Green from a Stevie Ray Vaughan article when I was a little kid I read this article and he said his favorite guitar player at the time was Grant Green and I said I got to figure this out and uh and I did I found this record called Alive and it, it's about the closest I've ever heard a guitar sound to a saxophone in my life. I mean, it sounds like Maceo Parker is playing a guitar. And uh, I just got obsessed with it. But there's a lot of, to address Danny's question. There's a thing that Grant used to do uh, a lot where he would play, like, I don't know, in the key of G. This thing's really misbehaving right now. Um, <laughs> All these double stops, you know, but he'd do it ryth rhythmically, like all that kind of stuff. And then, like, George Benson kind of got a hold of that. And when George Benson got a hold of it, it got more like. That kind of stuff, right? Yeah. So so the way I the way I've interpreted it the best I can is. So with my sound, I kind of think of it, I'm thinking of the guitar as like a B3 organ where you take the pinky finger and you hold the high note and then you play the clusters around the high note that you're pedaling on. Yeah. So that's where I ended up is if you put a little bit of fur on your sound, it starts to sound like a B3 because a B3 is always a little distorted. And the thing is, is when you listen to like, you know, Jimmy Smith or any of the great guys, they've always got that, the tubes are always crunching and stuff. So <laughs>
just I think of it as an organ. I mean, I always want. I'm a frustrated B3 organ player and drummer, basically. We couldn't. We didn't have those instruments in my house. We just. My dad's a guitar player, so I just played guitar. Actually, the first thing I wanted to. The first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to play saxophone like King Curtis, because my dad was really into King Curtis. So I spent a lot of time. And Junior Walker, you know, because my family. I'm, I'm from Michigan, and you know, my dad grew up playing in Detroit, and we lived in Dearborn and stuff. So the other thing was like saxophone players were really big for me, you know, like Junior Walker stuff um, was really big for me early on. So I've just listened to a lot of instruments that aren't guitar and tried to imitate them. And I think that's where I kind of hooked into that. Um, all right, anything else? That's a good question. Um, this is my big pedal board. This is the big one. Um, it's a Flint, Strymon Flint. And it's, I'm using the reverb today. I kind of, really, I use this for the vibrato. It has this really cool vibrato, the 61 tremolo setting. Sounds like a univibe to me. You know? Staples thing. So that's really what I use this for, but sometimes if I don't like the reverb in a rental or if the amp doesn't have reverb, I'll use the reverb on it. That's the reverb. Yeah, it's pretty good. So yeah, that's, and then the, the overdrive pedal is a so, exotic soul driven, it's called. It's an awesome pedal. I don't, in the studio, I don't use any distortion pedals. I just use, I just crank up either blackface or brownface fenders, or I have a Marshall Plexi, a 70 Marshall Plexi. So any of my records, you're not going to hear any distortion pedals. Um, I don't think I've used them on any of them, now that I think of it. I've used a fuzz pedal a few times. I have an old fuzz face, and then I had the analog man guy make me a sun face. That's great. It's beautiful. Like when I use a single coil guitar, I'll use, I'll bring that pedal out. If I have to do something that's rocking with single coils, I'll flip that sucker on and it really fattens it up nicely. So, but you know, I don't, I don't really, I'm kind of, I'm not really an effects guy. I'm not that guy. You got to go to another guy if you want to hear that. Yeah. Well, I love this. The, yeah, I love this. I've settled, I've settled on this as like, this is my like I said, it's my big it's my big rig. I mean, when I, you know, a lot of times, I remember, I've recently I've sat in with a couple of different acts where I got some questions online about what I was using when I sat in with them, and it was literally like, one of the times it was literally a Fender Blues Deville on ten, with no anything, just. You put, and I got all these questions like, what you know, what what distortion pedal is that, and what reverb are you using? And it's just like, I don't know, it's just a great sounding room with a tube amp, you know. Um, you get lucky now and then, you know. Um, but really, the distortion pedal for me is all about controlling stage volume for the room, because this room I have this amp on two, and it's too loud. So it's all about to me a distortion pedal is it's a simulation, so you're building an amp section in front of your amp. It's kind of, it's like a workaround to turning the amp up. But anywhere I can get away with turning up the amp, I'll do it. Yeah, no problem. Anyone else? Yeah. That's what they told me. Okay, so so Southern Blood record, yeah. that one. So on Southern Blood, I was using my touring rig with Greg Allman, which was a 65 reissue Super Reverb, but it had vintage new old stock tubes and Celestion G10 vintage speakers in it. And I was using a Supro with 115, and I was running them in parallel. It's funny, when I showed up at the recording session for Southern Blood, Don Was was the producer. Fame Studios, Muscle Shoals, Greg Allman's band, Greg Allman. This is not a low-rent production. And I get there the first day, and they've got 
70 fucking tube mics on everything. And then I go in the closet where the guitar is, and they literally have the goddamn SM57 stuck in the cone of the Super Reverb and nothing else. They'd left me one line with a 57. I said, I grabbed the engineer and I said, come with me. And I brought him to the percussion rig. I showed him the percussion rig. I said, you have New Neumann U87s on fucking timbales. Get those fucking 87s in the guitar. This is a Greg Allman record. Get those 87s in the guitar room and I'm gonna teach you how to mic guitars. They were not happy. Oh, no. Well, mainly because you know it's like I'm from I'm from Michigan. I'm not from Alabama, so. But but it 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 went great actually. We had a ball, and uh, when Don, Don was wasn't even there when he showed up, he was like, "Oh yeah, that shouldn't be set up like that." <laughs> but um, so I had to. But I did help with the miking. There's there's another mic that I actually brought in. Two mics that I brought in that made a big difference in my sound on every record I've done is the the uh, Fatheads. What's the name of the company that makes that? God, those are amazing. You put those Cascade Fatheads on the speaker and it sounds way better than an SM57, like infinitely better. And then I had a Royer stereo ribbon mic and I've been carrying those everywhere. And I mean, that's about the best guitar sound you're ever going to get. You get that Royer ribbon off the mic, off the uh, amp, and then you get the fat head on there, and you mix it, and it sounds great. Yeah, I don't think I think I did use a fuzz pedal on one song on Southern Blood. Yeah. It was on uh, Blind Bats and Swamp Rats. Yeah. That's that's the only effect I used on that record. Did you use Dwayne's guitar on the whole thing? No, I didn't use Dwayne's guitar on Southern Blood. I used Dwayne's guitar on my record, oh, on Saving Grace. Oh, no, so that tone, Saving Grace. I, I used Dwayne Allman's 57 gold top on like four songs. And those amps are a 52 Tweed Deluxe and my 65 Vibrolux in parallel. Yeah. <clears throat> and I use a, a radial tone bone box to split the signal. So you can flip the phase. If they're out of phase, you can flip it 180 if you need to. Because, you know, running two amps in parallel, they can be out of phase. So that's my one little trick instead of just, you know, jockeying the amps with a cable, because that can sound weird sometimes. Anyone else? We good? We've done this? All right, well, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll be able to roll through here again next summer. We'll see. I'll try to, I'll see if I can scare up some more friends next time, see if you can. We'll turn it into a party next time. Anyway, thanks so much for having me, guys. Have a great summer.